Good evening. Welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir, and my co-host today, as always, is Austin Davidson from Long Island, New York. hey yo. It's Season 2, Episode 29. Week 2 of the NFL season is underway. It's a Friday night. And before we get into previewing the Vikings and Steelers game, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Bengals and Texans game, which was played last night. The Texans open up, uh, or actually, I did not open up. They get some revenge for last week's loss and a tight defensive struggle. Uh, Deshaun Watson's first NFL start in the Bengals fall to 0-2, and they've yet to score a touchdown. Uh, this leading to... What was reported earlier today is the likely firing and now confirmed firing offensive coordinator Ken Zampisi. Zampis, I believe you say? How you say it? I uh, honestly have no clue. I was thinking that in my head. I was like, is it Zampisi or Zampis? I'm going to say Zampis, but I'm not sure. Zampis uh, had been with the Bengals coaching staff since 2003, but uh, in his first year as the offensive coordinator since Hugh Jackson left in 2016, the Bengals' offense took a nosedive across the board, uh, pretty much every statistical category you could think of. Uh, and no more is that apparent than their quarterback playing Andy Dalton, who had his best career year in Hugh Jackson's last year, and then, like the rest of the offense, struggled last season. And the the, or the first two games of this season, they really did not look good either. Uh, obviously, not scoring a touchdown through 120 minutes of football speaks for itself, but to give you a little perspective on how bad the Bengals have been this year, at least on offense, the Browns have double the amount of points the Bengals have this season, 18-9, to nine, and they've played in half the amount of games, you know, being 2-1. and one. So the Bengals are now, despite the fact that they have a long week off, they are now starting over with a new offensive coordinator, and they're looking... They're staring right in the mouth of an 0-3 start because they're going to Lambeau Field next week, and that's going to be quite a tough test for them. I, I really don't know what to make of this right now. All I know is that the Bengals are probably, uh, th- right now they'll be lucky to reach six wins, I think. I have to agree. It's looking really rough for them. I mean, I didn't really have hope for them, but I kind of saw them as like a 7-9 and nine team. It's starting to quickly go downhill with Andy Dalton playing the way he did. He he has four interceptions in these two games, and obviously, as we said, no touchdowns. Like, it's going really rough. The defense is actually holding up kind of decently. Like, they only kept the Texans to 13 points. I mean, the te- to be fair, though, the Texans only had three wide receivers dressed which was really disgusting, and all their tight ends were concussed and hurt, so they didn't really have a starting tight end either. So it wasn't that impressive, but even in uh, week one, they held Baltimore to 20. So I I think the defense is actually performing averagely. It's really the offense that is doing really disgusting here. And just to further put into perspective how bad uh, the offense is, Anthony Ciccolo, Dante Fowler Jr., and Ryan Kerrigan all have more touchdowns in one game than the entire Bengals team in two. So I just, I thought that was funny, just to kind of... Don't forget about Fletcher Cox. Oh, and Fletcher Cox. Oh, wait, didn't that get called back? I thought that got called back. Oh, did it? Did it? Uh, uh, I'm not sure. All I remember is I was watching, I had the Steelers game on my laptop while that game was on the TV, and I just happened to see it. It it might have been, but the point being, it really easily could have been Fletcher Cox added to that list. Look, I don't. I didn't have high hopes for the Bengals either, but I thought they were somewhere around five hundred, maybe seven to nine wins. This is this is very bad for them, and uh, I don't know. I just I actually would go a step further and say the defense has played very well. In fact, maybe even great, considering the fact that the offense has been so bad. When the offense is that bad, that means usually the defense is on the field for most of the game. And on top of that, when you're throwing four interceptions in a game like Andy Dalton did in week one, that usually means the defense is being given a short field to defend. So I'll actually go a step further and say they played really well, also including the fact that they were without Pac-Man Jones in week one, and they're still without Vontez Burfecht due to suspensions. So I think that that should tell you how well they've played and how bad the offense have been, has been on both sides of the ball there. On the flip side, how are the Texans? Are you sold on the Texans yet? Is Deshaun Watson the man now? I am sold on the Texans being bad. <laughs> That's about it. Um, 
just I think Sean Watson should be the starter. They draft him to be the starter. It doesn't really matter when he does start. And, and that's that's my opinion. It's just uh, when you draft a quarterback in the first round, I feel like the quicker he, uh, to start, the better because the the more he learns. Yeah, in some cases, when you start them in a bad situation, it's not the greatest. Like last year with Jared Goff, the Rams kind of threw him on a burning ship and said fix it. But Deshaun Watson wouldn't have been thrown on a burning ship. The Texans kind of had DeAndre Hopkins there to help him. They had C.J. Fedorowicz, who, who's okay. So I felt like the earlier the better. And Tom Savage was not performing anywhere close to where a, a quarterback that's good should be. So, I mean, just give your first-round rookie the chance and the shot to take it over because he, he can't really go much worse. I mean, I can't say that the Savage had, like, the worst ever game, like, his game was better than Andy Dalton's, but uh, but it's just when you draft a guy uh, that early, you might as well just hand him the start and see if he can handle it. But uh, as for the rest of the Texans, they're just they're just not good. I don't understand. But like the Texans defense was to be their killing point, and I guess I can't blame them. But uh, th- that first game was ugly. Then they obviously held Bengals to nine points. I'm gonna. I'm like flip flopping here because I'm trying to put it together, and then a lot. A lot of the reason the Jaguars won was because of defense. Okay, then again, it's that. it's also it's also only two games, so I'm still trying to go based off of last year. And based off of last year, the Texans have a good defense and practically no offense. So that's it's the same thing as we were talking about with the Bengals' defense being better than the numbers may may suggest because they're on the field all the time. I agree there. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of uh, Is that all you got to say about the Texans? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, we should learn a lot about the other teams in uh, in the league from after this week. And by week four, we should know pretty much where most of the teams are have stand, at least for the most part. I mean, doing what the Steelers and Packers did in their respective conferences last year, going on eight and nine, nine game winning streaks before finally losing in the conference championship games, those that's pretty rare. So. Uh, don't you, you usually know what a team is going to look like by the end of September. So this is a strange point in the season where we, you know, it's too hard to see who the contenders and pretenders are at this point. I also wanted to, do you see the Jadavian Clowney fumble recovery? I, he did a full windmill when he was running with the ball. I don't know if you saw that. I actually didn't. I was at work. All right. Well, at some point you have to watch that. Just not only like not really for like a talking point. I just thought it was kind of ridiculous that he he basically did a full windmill running with the football. That was kind of outrageous. But in any case, uh, we're gonna move on to our next bit of news. We'll get right into the Steelers and Vikings injury report. Uh, Austin, the big injury of note on the Viking side is Sam Bradford, who just recently underwent an MRI. Reports are that he's going to play, which means Case Keenum, their current backup, which I didn't know he was on the Vikings, is not going to play. Wasn't Joe Webb there? Uh, I, they might have brought him in after after cuts happened, but no, no, no. I he don't... was on he was on the uh, Panthers. He was on the Vikings a long time ago. That's what it was. Uh, that's why I was confused. I was like, I think the Panthers just cut him, but I didn't think a team brought him in. I was confused. Actually, there is a team that brought him in, but it was the Bills. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. Sorry for the confusion there, but in any case, uh, Bradford is definitely the biggest name on the injury report, but they have two other uh, important players in Xavier Rhodes and Anthony Barr. Do you know much about their status for Sunday's game? Anthony Barr was actually, like, he was game-time decision from the last thing I saw, which is a, kind of a big deal. Like, Xavier R- Rhodes, uh, I'm pretty confident, was uh, playing, but other... Uh, other than that, and obviously you said Sam Bradford was playing. But that's all I really know. That's all I really saw on them. Those are the only players listed. On the other side of the field, you're going to have the Pittsburgh Steelers. One player listed is out right now, and that's reserved offensive tackle Gerald Hawkins. Nothing too surprising there. He's got a knee injury. Uh, questionable three players. We have Vance McDonald with a back injury. I don't know if this is something he's been dealing with or if that's something that happened last week. I think it's something that happened last week. I'm pretty sure it happened right after that, that ball hit him right in the chest and he dropped it. <laughs> yeah, McDonald didn't have a good showing, and I don't recall him seeing the field much after that play, so that could have been the play where he suffered that injury. 
Uh, the other two players on this injury report for Pittsburgh, it's pretty easy to analyze and see where they got their injuries. Starting with Stefan Tuitt on the third, sorry, second play of the season, running Isaiah Crowell out of bounds. You see him grab his arm, uh, bicep injury. You know, we went from a whirlwind from early in the week after the game. It was likely a season ender. They're hoping it's not to, oh, maybe he'll only miss half the season to all of a sudden Mike Tomlin says he might be able to play this week and all of a sudden he's questionable. And while Austin, I think you and I can agree that it's unlikely he'll play this week, I think it's possible he actually could play this week if he really needed to, don't you think? I think so too, is. It's crazy that he's not doubtful uh, or questionable. I mean, he's not doubtful or out. My apologies. It's he's instead questionable. And when, when, like you said, there's just a crazy circus talking about. Oh, the Steelers have probably just lost to it for a year. Oh no, wait, he's gonna probably go on IR and come back uh, as designated to return. And then it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, uh, he might be back one to two weeks. We don't know. And so I honestly think if this was later in the year against the Ravens. Like he he would be coming back to play, but obviously we don't we don't want that here against an NFC team, as we said in the last podcast. And it's <clears throat> it's early in the season, no need to re re aggravate an injury at this point. But it is certainly the Steelers and stuff onto a dodged dodged a bullet. It really would have been some tragic irony the day after he signed that five year sixty million dollar deal. But I digress. Uh, The final man on the injury report is safety J.J. Wilcox with a concussion, and I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, The loser of uh, the week for me on defense last last episode is J.J. Wilcox for not only giving up the touchdown, uh, not only getting the penalty, which he was fined for, uh, $25,000. It didn't even get to that. We'll have to get to that in a moment. Uh, But he also knocked himself out and gave himself a concussion. So J.J. Wilcox has had a rough week, and he is questionable to play as well. Anything to say on poor J.J. over there? No, not much. It's, it's kind of rough to watch a player make a tackle and hurt himself. That, that's about it. One tackle, one guy who made a tackle named J.J., uh, real quickly, I wanted to go back to the game from last night. Did you say J.J. Watts tackle on the last play of the game? Oh, no, their poor center, Bodine. Yes, I did. <laughs> that is the right way to hit somebody. That is, he wasn't even ready. He's a center. He didn't know what was coming. <laughs> Poor guy. But back to the uh, the illegal hits, if you will. If you will, there were several. I think there were four or five questionable hits by Steelers defenders on Sunday, which is kind of a lot. It's definitely a lot. Uh, three players got fined. J.J. Wilcox and William Gay were reported, and Ryan Shazier said himself that he was also fined. They were all, th- all three of them were around $25,000 each. TJ Watt avoided a fine for a late hit on Deshaun Kaiser, but uh, what did you think about the fines for all three of these players? I thought they were all pretty fair given each of the circumstances. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised they didn't uh, find TJ Watt. I mean, it wasn't like a hard, hard hit. Uh, he just kind of jumped on the pile, uh, but I-, I-, I was still kind of surprised kind of seeing how the rules are. Other than that, J.J. Wilcox made sense to me. The Ryan Shazier one made sense. The William Gay one probably made the most sense out of all of them. So uh, I, I can't say, oh, the NFL really missed the mark here because I, I, I think they were deserved mostly. I think they were definitely earned. Were you surprised Ben Roethlisberger didn't get some sort of a fine or slap on the wrist for what he did uh, after that uh, interception? I, I honestly didn't know what to think of that because I was trying to think of why that was really uh, uh, illegal like that. He twisted. He twisted the defender's knee. That's what it was. Reported. Oh, okay. I, I didn't. I, I didn't get a good look at it, but that's what I heard other people talking about. He he cut. He brought him down. I just. I don't know. I I was just confused on the whole thing on why Roethlisberger was even doing it. He said he was doing it to protect his teammates, but. Yeah. Okay. Was, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like a, just a story to say <laughs> whatever i i heard people bringing up the narrative that maybe he should be punished just to show that you know quarterbacks and offensive players aren't immune to fines save for you know uh an illegal crackback block but it seems like the nfl did chose not to go that route and you know it wouldn't really have mattered for roethlisberger he has plenty of money to cover for it so uh not much to say on that then so now we can get into the game. 
So looking at the offense, uh, Todd Haley, Mike Tomlin, the entire coaching staff, the entire offense, save for Antonio Brown and Jesse James, struggled for large portions of last Sunday's game against the Browns. They'll face a much stiffer test, albeit at home, against the Minnesota Vikings defense. The, the offense has a much tougher battle this week in a game against a pretty solid defense with Xavier Rhodes, Harrison Smith, Everson Griffin, and Anthony Barr, who may not be playing, but still. point is, uh, they have a great guy on every level on the defense. Even without Barr, they have Michael Kendricks at uh, middle linebacker. So the Steelers' offensive line is really going to be uh, put to the test here, having to face Griffin, Hunter, and Joseph, who are way better than the Browns' defensive line, at least without Miles Garrett. Uh then Antonio Brown is actually going to have one of the better cornerbacks in the league lined up against him at times. So other people in the offense are going to have to produce because Brown can't put up 184 yards and 11 receptions every game, at least not realistically. Uh, Xavier Rhodes is actually was able to shut down Odell Beckham Jr. last year for, for the most part. I can't remember the exact stat line, but I remember that game being a big deal because he kept Odell Beckham to, I think, only – somewhere around three catches or something. So that was a big deal back then. And it, do, it, it doesn't really line up with Antonio Brown because it depends where you uh, rank Odell and Antonio Brown comparatively. But a lot of people have them really close, so I, I guess that, that's a big deal. Uh, but continuing on, Eli Rogers and Juju Schuster will both need to step up in this game. And Sue's plan is to run four wide receiver sets again like they did last week. But most of all, Martinez Bryan is going to need to step up more. He definitely didn't look like the Bryan from 2015 last week, and he's going to have to do something to either get himself open or get Antonio Brown open since there uh, there has been a lot of expectations from him. Moving on, uh, this isn't exactly the best place for Le'Veon Bell to actually get going because, again, probably the strongest part of the Vikings' defense is their defensive line. So while I hope for the Bell to get more – I hope for Bell to get more touches, I don't expect him to really thrive here. Who knows, though? Bell did score his first ever touchdown against the Vikings uh, in London, so you never really know. Uh, what does your offensive preview look like? That game against the Vikings in London was actually the last time these two teams played. <clears throat> that loss dropped the Steelers to 0-4 in the 2013 season. Do you remember that season at all? Uh, yeah, that was a really bad season, yep. Funny how that season worked out. At 8-8, eight and eight, it's probably the worst season the Steelers have had since 2003. Uh, that, I don't know, that, I don't really, I was thinking today about that. I was trying to remember what I was thinking at that point when the Steelers were 0-4, and I thought, I was probably thinking something like the Steelers were probably looking at a losing season, and that I had never seen them this bad. It's something I really don't, like, because I don't remember watching football much when they were bad the last time they had a losing record, and the worst seasons I remember are the three eight and eight years following following Super Bowl forty the Super Bowl forty one in two thousand six, the twenty twelve and thirteen years back to back eight and eight, and the Super Bowl hangover in 09 when they went nine and seven. Like that was a frustrating season and they had a winning record. So we have really been spoiled, but I was I just I couldn't remember what I was thinking because it was so long ago and I I just don't remember what it was like for the Steelers to be that deep in the hole when it came to the win loss column. It was very strange. But Anyways, back from my tangent on that, as you were saying, this is going to be a very good test for the Steelers offense, who definitely wanted a mulligan on last week's performance, which could have acted as maybe another tune-up game for them. Uh, There are stars on this defense, unlike most of the Browns' defense, minus Miles Garrett. This is a very solid and, and actually a very good defensive unit as a whole. Last season, they finished third overall in total defense and passing yards against. So this absolutely is not a defense the Steelers can take lightly or perform. They can't have their, they can't have a bad game against them. Uh, They held a pretty solid offense in the New Orleans Saints to just 19 points. Drew Brees in that offense, just one touchdown. So the key difference between here and last week, in my opinion, it comes from the coaching staff. They need to look at what, what they did well, or in this case, what they didn't do well last week. Uh, last week, Greg Williams, the always aggressive defensive coordinator that he is, often walked one, sometimes even both safeties up into the box, uh, basically daring the Steelers to throw the ball deep. And certainly we're saying don't run the ball because we'll stop it. Well, the Steelers decided to uh, 
try to attack it with quick screens, and that didn't work. Uh, that didn't work out for the first few plays of the game. So when they got away from that, instead of trying to take the deep ball to take the top off of that defense, they decided to run right into the strength of that defense. So they wasted a lot of downs trying to run Le'Veon Bell and James Conner into those eight or nine man fronts. So the offense really couldn't get anything done, and the coaching staff really dropped the ball there on making the proper adjustments. So they can't make those types of adjustments, those the incorrect adjustments for the second week in a row. Uh, the Vikings aren't going to be as aggressive as Cleveland was because they have a better defense, specifically in the defensive backfield. And uh, the offensive line is going to have to have a big game because they have to be able to open up enough room for Le'Veon Bell to make the big plays on the ground that open up the passing game. Uh, ben is going to have uh, – this might be a tougher game, at least as far as uh, – having enough time to throw the ball. You know that with the without those extra men in the box, the Vikings are probably going to be trying to keep those quick passes from happening. So that means the Steelers receivers are going to have probably, it's going to take them a little longer to get open, Sands Antonio Brown, facing a tougher secondary, kind of like what happened against New England mm-hmm. last year. And that was the big difference. Antonio Brown was getting cover, double covered and no one else was getting open. So this is a big game for guys like you mentioned, Eli Rogers, Juju Smith-Schuster, Martavis Bryant, Vance McDonald. These guys all need to step up in a big way compared to last week for the Steelers' offense to be able to move the ball consistently. And I think they will be better at home this week than they were last week to start the season, but I still don't see points being easy to come by. On the other side of the ball... It was kind of a strange revelation that Sam Bradford and the Vikings offense had last week, but do you think it's something that they can sustain? Uh, I'm honestly not sure. Coming into the season, the Vikings offense was one of the worst in the league, but now they look actually above average. And that was kind of confusing. We still, uh, like you said in the beginning of this podcast, we don't know the pretenders from the contenders. So it could have just been, wow, they played the New Orleans secondary here. So uh, they did, they just thrived and they'll never do that good against the, uh, Decent secondary. We don't know, but uh, I'm going to stick with that. I do think they're actually decent. So uh, receivers, uh, Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen, looked great against the Saints. And while Sam Bradford is a bit hurt going into this game, he played fantastically as well. However, what is holding the Vikings back is their offensive line, which is rather mediocre. And this should be another uh, decent game for the Steelers' defensive line and linebackers, even without to it. Also, uh, seeing as the Steelers did as the Steelers did against the run last week, if they can keep it up, uh, Dalvin Cook and Latavius Murray should end up as almost non-factors in this game. Uh, really, this is going to be about how the safeties play, and if Artie Burns, Joe Hayden, and William Gay can keep up with the Vikings' promising receivers, the linebackers are also going to have to keep uh, Ryle, uh, Ryle, Kyle Rudolph in check, too. He caught a touchdown last week, so you can't really forget about him. Uh, what does your defensive outlook look like? Uh, well, it's it's definitely interesting. I took some time to watch the highlights from mon- last Monday night's game between the Saints and Vikings. It really felt like I was watching a mirror image of the Chiefs and Pats game from the opening Thursday night. Uh, the typical veteran quarterback you would expect to have the, the better game and Drew Brees, uh, like Tom Brady, got outdueled by a guy who was typically considered a game manager at best in Sam Bradford. I like to think of him as a poor man's Alex Smith, uh, to be completely honest with you. Uh, Bradford had the game of his life, much similar to Alex Smith, going over 300 passing yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, and five incompletions on the night. Bradford, by the way, set an NFL record for 71, I think it was 71.6 completion percentage in a single season, which is an NFL record. Uh, the Vikings offense was just on fire and anything they did on Monday night was working. And uh, I don't know, the Saints defense is just nothing to write home about. And on paper, the Vikings don't have that powerful of an offense. And they definitely do have some big playmakers like the Chiefs do. But I don't know, it's still something to be concerned about. You can't take those guys lightly. But at the same point, I still like I'm not sold on the Vikings offense. Uh, But the two guys that you obviously are going to have to keep an eye out for, particularly in the passing game, are Kyle Rudolph, the tight end, who you mentioned. At 6'5", 260, he's a long target. He's a good red zone threat, and he's someone that, you know, pretty much fits the mold for a player the Steelers have struggled to cover for the most part over the past, you know, five, ten years now. So he's someone you want to look out for. 
The other guy is Stefan Diggs, who had two touchdowns on seven catches for 93 yards. So the Steelers are going to have to key in on him. Oh, I'm, I wish I wrote this down. Who was the, what was the name of the other receiver? Thielen? Thielen. He went wild on Monday night. Where did he come from? He actually did good at the end of last season. He was a fantasy sweetheart at, at the end. So he, he, he's actually, he isn't really new. new. He, can't, he was new last season at the end of it because he showed up. So he's still like only a few weeks new, but he's, he was starting to do good really at the end of last season. Keep, yeah, keep in mind, the Vikings started hot last year and then cooled off a lot to end the year. So when he was playing well at the end of the year, uh, he wasn't getting any national attention because the Vikings were out of the playoff race. I think he finished with something like 60 catches. Uh, and he had his, his best career game, I believe, last week, over 100 yards. So he's someone to look out for as well. But as you mentioned, the weak point of this offense is definitely their offensive line. Compounded with the Bradford injury right now, I think you can expect the Vikings to try to establish the run in this game and set up a lot of quick passes because they don't want him getting hurt, but especially after the best game of his life, for sure. Uh, the Vikings used all three of their running backs last week, I believe. Uh, did they use Latavius Murray? Yes, they did. They didn't use him a lot, but they did use all three of their running backs. You have the rookie Dalvin Cook, the proven veteran in Latavius Murray, and the guy Jarek McKinnon, who's been there, for, seems like, forever. Uh, they're all decent backs, but I don't think, like, I don't think they're going to be able to take the load off of Bradford, and it's going to be a pretty simple game plan for the Steelers' defense. Do what Greg Williams did last week. Load up the box, see if Sam Bradford can beat you deep, and repeat his career best game just to have a shot at beating you. Otherwise, I think the the Ram sorry the Rams, the Vikings are going to have a pretty tough time moving the ball and scoring on the Steelers' defense. I believe. This is a game where I think the pass rush is going to continue to impress uh, as well. Uh, you want to take a little look at the special teams outlook? I don't really have anything to say about it. Sure. So the special teams impressed last week. Uh, so you got to think they keep it up here. Not crazy uh, punt block touchdowns probably, but I think they will be able to limit the Vikings uh, return of Sherrill's to not many yards. And I don't think he's that great. Other than that, I have no reason to doubt that Bayer Boswell will do uh do as good as they normally do and i i expect returns to be met all season so i i have no hope for that i'm just hoping for smith schuster to show something this week that, that that's not really that could be on special teams or offense i don't really care maybe he gets um, a maybe he gets like an actual return this week last week he caught a pooch kick and was able to basically take it like a few yards before falling down yeah I, it, it, it'd be nice to get a, a little test drive so uh want to talk about your keys to the game for offense that's right our keys to the game on offense at least the way i see it is get Le'Veon bell going in some way or fashion on the ground uh, it's gonna be tough sledding i'd be surprised if he gets over 100 yards on the ground but it's gonna at least have bell be effective enough on the ground to make the defense respect it make them at least think a little bit make that safety think for a split second that oh this could be a run maybe i have to stop it on a play action fake and then maybe that gives you just enough separation to hit him with the deep ball. Uh, the Vikings' strong defensive backfield is definitely going to slow down the offensive attack, and points are going to be hard to come by, as I said. Uh, it's probably going to take long, time-consuming drives, but if the Steelers' offense can play that typical old-style ball control offense, I think it'll open up some big plays late in the game that might be able to help them score some more points. But I, it's going to take uh, it's going to take a strong rushing performance to get the Steelers receivers time and separation on those passing routes. What's your key to the game on offense? Uh, Martavis Bryant needs to contribute this game. Uh, it, it's it's a major key, major key to this game. I, and I also don't mean just getting involved on bubble screens. I, I want to see more of those explosive plays that he had shown two years ago and maybe even use him as a, a rusher again. He's just going to need to get more than two catches and 14 yards for the Steelers to win this one because Antonio Brown's matchup is not as favorable as it was last week. So let's hear your defensive key to the game. I said it earlier. It's pretty simple. Stop the run and force Sam Bradford to throw the deep balls. Uh, it's not rocket science here. Bradford is hurt and traditionally not a strong deep passer, save from last week. Uh, a relatively weak offensive line, and that injury means that quick passes in a running game is going to be the offense's emphasis. So playing press coverage and loading up the box should be 
the remedy to that, just make sure you're ready to guard the deep ball because it will be coming. Uh, shut that down. Make those quick throws difficult like the Browns did for Roethlisberger last week. That's all I really have to say. Are you in agreement with your key? Uh, I, I definitely do. It's uh, I think that the uh, they are going to need to contain that run, but I also think they're going to need to have to provide a consistent pass rush without blitzing. Uh, if the Steelers can't do that against this line, they're going to be in trouble. A big part of stopping this offense is going to be putting Sam Bradford under pressure while still having a lot of guys in coverage, making it hard for him to find his open receivers. Uh, because he was throwing absolute darts against the Saints. And, and while, yes, the Saints secondary is worse than the Steelers, I guess that's more of an uh, opinion, but I, I think so. It's it's still key that the Steelers can get a, a decent pass rush going against a, a not-so-great line without having to blitz five people at, at the same time. So... Let's move along to X-Factors. Who's your X-Factor on offense? Well, I'm double-dipping a bit here, which might not be fair, but last week I hit the nail on the head with the X-Factor, that being Jesse James. He came through for me and scored two both the Steelers' offensive touchdowns, 41 yards on six catches. He played fantastic, probably the game of his life. And uh, I'm, I'm after all of that, I'm coming back, and I'm saying I'm not sold on him yet. I picked him to be my X-Factor last week, and he absolutely was. But this is the real test for Jesse James. His biggest issue throughout his young career has been consistent consistency. A big performance again this week could show that maybe this is the real Jesse James. Maybe he actually was pushed by Vance McDonald. Maybe, maybe he finally accessed that second level we thought he might be able to get to. And uh, he'll have a chance to prove himself uh, as... It sounds like Vance McDonald is injured and either might not play or probably won't play much. So James, it's James's job again, and he's going to have to prove that it should still be his job. And uh, maybe it's a week by week thing, but I think uh, if he can manage to do this, a, kind of repeat a good performance like he did last week for a few more weeks. There's no reason to think that Vance McDonald should overtake him unless, if of course, he does something outrageous with the. Uh, his opportunities, but I haven't seen, uh, we haven't seen anything from McDonald yet. So the jury is still out on him on offense. Who is the X factor you're looking at? I would just like to say, I, I really enjoy that. You're, you're like daring Jesse James to do good, like daring him to secure that starting role back after Vance McDonald got brought in. But, um, my, my offensive, uh, X factor is Eli Rogers. I spoke about it earlier, but Eli Rogers is going to, I need to get open just like Martavis Bryant needs to. Well, at least one of them does, but that's why Rogers is my X Factor. He has a better chance to get open than Bryant does. And if he does, you can put this game on his shoulders and have a career game here, in my opinion. So who is your defensive X Factor? Uh, the, I'm, the Austin is such uh, the Austin the oh my god. The <laughs> slot is such a key position and I think it's definitely the right way to go as far as the X Factor goes. It's definitely it, you you might be able to say, oh, it's the easy way out, but I think every, I think it's actually easier to say Martavis Bryant's the X factor just because of how how poorly he played last week. So I think Eli Rogers that is that guy that always kind of sneaks around, and I think he's going to be a terrific X factor in his own right. But on defense, I picked Javon Hargrave, the defensive tackle. Now, there's a few reasons I chose this. Uh, First and foremost, if the Steelers' game plan is going to be focusing on what I think it's going to be, that means that the rush defense is going to be a very important part of the defense. And that begins and ends with the nose tackle in the 3-4 defense, uh, as it always did with Casey Hampton and uh, Steve McClendon before Hargrave. Uh, If Hargrave can be a good and responsible run defender like he typically is, the Steelers' defense should be in good shape to at least start stopping the run and therefore can get after Bradford if they do what they want to do. But Hargrave's impact here, why he's my X Factor, could be twofold, particularly as a pass rusher. Uh, with stuff onto it most likely missing this game, we're going to see more of what Hargrave has developed as a pass rusher. And this is important because we saw a little bit of what he could do as a pass rusher last year when Cameron Hayward went down with a season ending injury. Hargrave performed well at times, but also wasn't wasn't overly dominant as a pass rushing, almost hybrid defensive end nose tackle. But last week, I, I do you remember this play? He basically pushed, uh, uh, what's the center's name from Cleveland? Uh, J.C. Treader. He basically he pushed that man, like I think it was like 10 yards into the backfield and got after Deshaun Kaiser. Do you remember that play? 
I do remember that play. He, he treated that grown man like a child. To quote Ike Taylor on the uh, on the NFL highlights from after that game, he said that that's somebody's child right there. <laughs> and uh, Hargrave had no uh, no regard for that man's life right there. But the point being is that Hargrave has shown that that extra motor, that super dominant. You know, dare I say something like a Joe Green or someone from the you know, the steel curtain era, someone who could just turn it on and, you know what, I'm going to get after this guy and there's no one that's going to stop me. And I want to see a little bit more of that. And I think, I think he can provide that. So I think he's going to have a big game this week. And you, your, uh, your X factor on defense, who is it? I'm going to, I'm having a change of heart. While I was, while you were talking about Javon Hargrave, I was, is, I had Joe Hayden down as my defensive X factor, but what came up in my heart, I got Tyson Alualu now. I I don't know why, but I think because the defensive line is just going to eat together. I think along with J, uh, Javon Hargrave, uh, T- Tyson Alualu with Stefan to it out is going to eat. He's going to take this opportunity that he's going to be a, a possibly a starter. I guess they could make it LT Walton if they wanted to, but I think Tyson Alualu is going to get more playing time regardless. And he's going to get in there and be an X factor. He's going to try to do his best step onto it uh, impression and, get, and put some pressure on there. Because the former, I think, number six overall pick, I think he wants to get back to at least playing like a starter. So change it on the spot to Tyson Alu Alu. Feed those defensive linemen. They're big boys. <laughs> I think it's going to be a big game all around for all those guys. So now, now that we got... Through our X factors, I'm going to jump right into my bold prediction. Sticking with Javon Hargrave, I think he has his career best game as a pass rusher and leads them with two and a half of six total sacks on Sam Bradford. Uh, elsewhere, I think uh, this is actually kind of a strange one because I don't really have much reason to believe this will happen, but I just went super bold this week for whatever reason. I, I looked at my bold predictions from last week and then I saw Jesse James scoring two touchdowns and I was like, I really didn't. My predictions were really not that bold, so that's why this one comes from... That's why I I decided to go with this next one. So this one, Ben Roethlisberger does not throw a touchdown, ending the longest active streak for consecutive games with a passing touchdown at home, which is also the third longest of all time at 44 games. So that's a big, bold prediction for me. And the final one is that the Steelers, all three of their touchdowns, which I predict they'll have, will come from three different players, all of which being on the ground, being Le'Veon Bell, James Conner, and Martavis Bryant. Austin, what are your bold predictions for Sunday's game? I'm going to stick with my X-Factor as well here, but for offense, and Eli Rogers gets his best career game here, getting six receptions for 107 yards and a touchdown. Uh, and for those of you don't, who don't know, his, his best game before this was either, it depends on how you view touchdowns, was six receptions for 103 yards against the loss to Baltimore last year or six receptions for 59 yards and the touchdowns against the Redskins last year. And that was when he caught the deflection off of Sammy Coates' hands. But uh, I think he's going to outshadow those both by getting more yards and a touchdown in the game. Next, I have the Vikings receivers combining for less than 120 yards on uh, in the passing game. And then finally, in his first game back, Dupree is going to re- – record a sack a pass defense and an interception i think he's gonna go uh go off in this game and now we're gonna go right into the final score prediction i think with all these uh, bold predictions i think it's gonna be a low scoring affair i think that the nfl is gonna continue the trend and uh pittsburgh's gonna win 17 to 10 really low scoring affair so what is uh your final score prediction i have a relatively low scoring game considering the steelers offense again although it, it it's more in line with traditional uh <clears throat> traditional average scores i have the steelers eking out a close win against the vikings 24 to 20 and uh, that'll wrap up our look at the steelers and vikings week two at heinz field one o'clock game again by the way on fox and now we'll take a quick look around the rest of the nfl something new we're trying out uh we're looking at the vegas lines for uh betting for each of the games we missed thursday night obviously between the bengals and texans but we talked at length about that game so now let's uh, we'll get into it game by game. Uh, Austin, I will declare obviously the game, who's playing who, and I'll uh, mention the line. So uh, for instance, uh, this the first game we have the Cleveland Browns at the Baltimore Ravens. The Ravens are eight point favorites. 
Austin can then either pick the Ravens to cover, uh, take the Browns and the point, like take the Browns uh, with the points, the eight points, or just pick the Browns outright. And uh, we'll we'll go back and we'll keep track of this throughout the season. But I just wanted to try something different this week. So uh, that being said, the Ravens are eight point favorites at home. Uh, who do you who do you got here? Uh, I actually have have the Ravens winning, but they don't cover the spread. Who do you got? So you have the Browns plus eight. Uh, no. Browns. Well, well I guess Browns outright. Is that? You have, having the Browns outright would mean you'd have them winning the game. Oh, okay. All right, so I, I just I just have the Ravens don't cover but win. Yeah, that would be Browns plus eight. Okay. And uh, I'm going a little different uh, from you here. I have the Ravens covering. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe the maybe I shouldn't be taking their Week One win against the Bengals too seriously because of how bad we now know the Bengals' offense is. But I still think the Ravens have a very dangerous defense, and I just I think it's going to be a rough day for Deshaun Kaiser. So. I think the Ravens cover here. Tennessee Titans traveling to Jacksonville to take on the Jaguars. The Titans are only one and a half point favorites. Uh, I gave, uh, I think the Titans cover the spread here. I don't think the Jaguars are really as good as as they seem. I just think the Texans are that bad and the whole AFC South is sort of that bad. So I have the Titans covering. It was a very, very bizarre game when the Jaguars won by as much as they did against the Texans. I agree with you. The Titans covered this one. It's just, I think, I don't know, I just think it's too much, and Allen Robinson's gone now, so the Jaguars' offense is essentially Leonard Fournette, and we know how well that worked out for for many running backs when they're the only offensive option. Uh, Buffalo at Carolina. Carolina is a seven-point favorite. See, that surprised me. I have Buffalo winning outright. I don't think Carolina is that good. Carolina played the 49ers. I know they, they didn't. Uh, they kind of kept the 49ers in check, but, I mean, that's not that impressive. And Buffalo, I know Buffalo didn't have the greatest game against the Jets, but still, I, I feel like a division game is always going to be harder than a just a random NFC game. I, I don't know. So I have Buffalo winning outright. Uh, what do you think? You're right. This has kind of a strange trap game feel for the Panthers. I don't know. It's strange. I, I really wouldn't see the Bills starting 2-0, and but, I mean, I guess you could give them the win against the Jets. Oh, this just feels like a game where I feel like Tyrod Taylor is going to ball out. So I'm going to give Buffalo the up upset, and they're going to win outright. Um, and then the next game, we have uh, quite an interesting uh, game. The Patriots coming back from their season opening loss last Thursday night. They're traveling to New Orleans to take on the Saints, who just got smoked by the Vikings. Uh, the, the Patriots are six-point favorites on the road. Uh, I'm definitely going to go with New England covers the spread. I think Tom Brady's pissed. I think Tom Brady is going to come back, and he might have a, a career game here, which is surprising for Tom Brady to have a, a, a career game. But he's going to be playing pissed off. The whole Patriots are going to be playing pissed off. Even, you know what actually might stop them, though? Their defense might stop them. They're going to be without Dante Hightower this week. But I'm still going to uh, say that New England covers the spread. What do you think? Conventional wisdom and history is on your side, Austin. There's no logical reason for me choosing what I chose, but I actually have the Saints with the points, so I think it'll be a close game. I don't know. I just I always feel like the Saints at home are pretty good, even though recent history they haven't been as good in the Superdome. I just think Drew Brees is a much better player when he's in the uh, Superdome, and even though I think the Patriots win and they play great on offense, I just I don't know. Watching their defense get torn apart by Alex Smith, as great as he played, I just I don't know. I feel like. They're more suspect than we thought they were. And that's good news for us. But, you know, obviously it's one game, so we'll we'll keep it in perspective. Next game, Arizona at Indianapolis. Arizona is a seven-point favorite traveling to Indianapolis where Jacoby Brissett has been named the starter after Scott Tolzien threw two pick sixes against the Los Angeles Rams. Who do you got for this one? I have Arizona covering the spread. I just I, – I, like I said – uh, last episode, I think the Colts might be the worst team in the NFL, uh, if not the worst, w- without Andrew Luck. And even with Andrew Luck, they're maybe mid-tier. So it's just a really rough time. Even with Br- uh, Brissett, he's only go- – he is really new. Like, he doesn't I- – I feel like he hasn't had enough time to get used to the system yet, but we will see. But I have Arizona covering the spread. Who do you got? I have Arizona covering, too. I just – I wanted to – have the Colts take the points, but I just, like, how are they going to score? 
yeah, Arizona may have trouble scoring without David Johnson. They have Carson Palmer, but I just, I don't know. I've always felt like the Colts are just a lost football team without uh, without Andrew Luck. And it's kind of funny. I was thinking, I, re- I was listening to another show, and I was they were talking about the coaching matchup. And it's kind of funny how Bruce Arians was uh, Chuck Pagano's offensive coordinator uh, that one year. And it's quite clear now Bruce Arians is a much better football coach. Oh, easily. Quite easily. Funny to think about things like that. Next game, the Philadelphia Eagles travel to Kansas City to take on the 1-0 Chiefs, who are on extended rest. The Chiefs are five-and-a-half-point favorites at home. Uh, I have uh, Philadelphia uh, plus a 5.5 spread. I, I just, uh, For some reason, I think the game is going to be too close. I, at first, I feel like Philadelphia might be a tiny bit better than people are expecting, so I, I, I have them uh, plus 5.5. What do you, who do you got? Carson Wentz uh, <clears throat> looked pretty good last week against the Redskins, and he might be for real now. He may have uh, he may have turned the corner, and he didn't have a bad year last year, but he finally ran into that rookie wall, and it looks like he could be for real now. But all that being said, I think the Chiefs are flying high, and I think they're better than we all thought they were after watching them dismantle the Patriots' defense. They're on extended rest, and they've had extra time to prepare for the game, so I think Kansas City covers this week. Uh, next week, next game, sorry. Uh, Chicago Bears at Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm going to, I had a thought about this game, but I'm actually going to change it. The Buccaneers are seven point favorites at home. I am actually going to change my mind and say Chicago plus seven. You know what I, I, I was thinking? I was thinking that Tampa Bay was going to come in here and just ruin the Bears because they're not that good. But I forgot that Tampa Bay actually had a bye week, week one, and this is going to be their first game. So I'm going to say, Tampa Bay hasn't shaken off the rust yet and and Chicago plus seven. Who do you got? That's very interesting, Austin. By that same logic, I'm changing mine from the Bears plus seven to Tampa Bay covers. (laughs) And (laughs) my reasoning for that is just because I think the coaching staff has an extra week to analyze the Bears. Now they have tape of the Bears, and the Bears don't have tape of the Buccaneers. So that's my reasoning for it. There's, there's, you know, there's good... uh, I think it's a good way either way because you could say the Bears figured out they fine-tuned the mistakes that they had, but at the same time they have they have their mistakes on tape and the Buccaneers can see that. So I'm going to go with the Buccaneers covering here. Uh, speaking of another team on a bye week, the other team in Florida, well, I guess not the other, one of the other teams in Florida, the Miami Dolphins at the Los Angeles Chargers. The Chargers are three-and-a-half point favorites in their first home game in LA since 1964 uh, I have no clue. go ahead though uh, I have Miami winning out right my logic doesn't make sense since I just picked Chicago but I, I don't know I feel like the Chargers are really good at blowing games like like they're just really really good I don't know if you watched the uh the, the Monday night game last week but it was really really rough because the Chargers started making a fourth quarter comeback and immediately just found a way to not tie it up. So I have Miami winning out, right? Who do you got? It's something like they're one and nine in the last 10 games dating back to last year when they, when it's a one score game, something like that. They've really lost a ton of close games. Uh, you know, it's strange. I Conventional wisdom would actually agree with you, Austin, because Miami had that extra week, but Jay Cutler's their quarterback. So Chargers cover. That's all I got. Jets at Raiders. Oakland, 13 and a half point favorites at home. That's, I believe, the biggest. No, no, no. It's it's not, actually. It's not the biggest uh, spread this week, but it is very big. Almost two touchdown favorites against the Jets. What do you got? Uh, I, th- I think the Raiders win and cover the spread. I think the Jets are a really, really bad team. So, uh, who do you have? Oh, man. I really... I'm looking at this and I'm really thinking I'm, I'll probably be wrong, but I don't know. 13 and a half points is just oh my God. 13 and a half points is just a ton of points. I just, I don't, oh, I keep thinking about this. The more I want to change this, the jets could, I don't know. I could actually see the jets going 0 16. That would not surprise me this year, but I would, I'm just going to have to go with the jets 13 and a half points here. It's still early in the year. I still think the Raiders may not have uh, may not have that 
that extra gear right now. They won a close game against the Titans, but maybe maybe the Jets can hang on and can stay within two touchdowns. I I don't know. I don't think they will. The more that the more and more I think about it, the less likely I am. But I'm too far now, so I'm committing to the Jets plus thirteen and a half. Next game, Washington Redskins at the Los Angeles Rams, who are coming off a huge win over the Indianapolis Colts last week. The Rams are two and a half point favorites over the Redskins. Who do you got? I think the Redskins win outright. I think the Rams are overrated and Washington is sort of underrated since they just lost to Philadelphia. But the thing is, I think Philadelphia is a better team. I think the Colts are one of the worst teams. So I think both teams are a little bit messed up. So people think the Rams are better than they are and the Washington is worse than they are. So I go with Redskins winning outright. Who do you got? That makes sense, but I just oh, – I, I watched Jared Goff last week, and I I got really excited because I, I always thought based on – even last year, the way he played, I was like, this guy sucks. But then all of a sudden he showed me something last week, and I'm like, maybe, just maybe this guy is something. So – I'm going to put some faith in Jared Goff uh, this week after a big game last week, and I'll say that the Rams cover this week with the two-and-a-half-point spread. Uh, Next game, the Dallas Cowboys traveling to Denver to take on the Broncos at Mile High. The Cowboys are two-and-a-half-point favorites on the road. Who do you got? I have Dallas covering the spread only because of their offensive line and um, and and Ezekiel Elliott. I think Denver is one weak point in their whole defense. They really are. I, I don't think they're that good against the run. They, they've shown it that they're not that good against the run, which has always really surprised me because I, I, everyone thinks their defense as a whole is good. I don't know. I always see them giving up huge runs to running backs. Uh, so I'm going to go with Dallas winning and covering the spread. Who do you got? I'm going to give Denver winning outright, and uh, it's kind of surprising, but I just think that until – Think about this for a second. The Cowboys and Broncos play once every four years, and the fact that they probably haven't played in mile high in probably something like eight years. Playing in mile high is something that's very different than any other NFL stadium, and I think that gives them a slight advantage. And even though the uh, the Cowboys might be running the ball, they'll be trying to pound and ground and try to tire out the Broncos' defense. I think they might actually do more to tire out their own offense in that manner. Uh, because the Broncos are used to that. So maybe they may not be super effective at stopping the run, but I think if it's a uh, tough, grinded-out kind of game, I think that actually might favor the Broncos as they'll be in better shape to endure in that kind of weather. So by that strange logic, I actually think Denver is going to win this game outright. Uh, so I'll take Denver uh, over over the two-and-a-half points outright. Uh, next, we have the San Francisco 49ers at Seattle. The biggest spread of the week. Seattle is a 14-point favorite at home. Who you got? I I have a San Francisco plus a 14-point spread. I, I just – Seattle right now is in a really tough spot, and I don't understand how teams are still – I mean teams. I don't know how people are still saying that this is a really great team because they're really not. That offensive line is number 32 in the league. I, I could say that with, with – you know, I, I keep saying the – the Colts might be. I keep saying that the Jets might be the worst team in the league. I can tell you with full confidence that Seattle's offensive line is number 32 in the league right now. And that is going to get Russell Wilson hurt. That is going to screw them as he gets sacked all the time, Put gets put under pressure. I don't think they're going to lose. I just I think they're very, very overrated this year. And I, I, I just don't understand how they're still – getting overrated when their their offensive line is playing like that where Russell Wilson has to move out of the pocket every single play. I don't, I don't know if you saw like the meme pictures of it, but uh, there was like quotes like Seattle's line got better this year and then there's three guys chasing Russell Wilson in the backfield while his offensive line tries to catch up running backwards. Uh, but yeah, back to, back to uh, the situation at hand. Seattle uh, wins, doesn't cover the spread, so San Francisco plus 14. Mm. Who do you I'm in complete agreement with you. The Packers def- defense, which is not known as a very good unit, really kept the Seahawks in check all game on uh, Sunday. And that was felt very weird watching. It felt like I was watching the 2010 version of the Packers that won the Super Bowl. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't have an off a good off have a good offensive line versus having a good offensive line, look at the difference between a team like Dallas and Pittsburgh versus Seattle. 
not having a good offensive line can wreck your game plan. It can wreck what you want to do. The, the Seahawks have playmakers at receiver. They've got a good tight end. They've got a really good quarterback. I'm not sold on their running backs. I don't think their running backs are good, but that's that's something else entirely. It could be a byproduct of their offensive line. If they can't make holes for the running backs, I don't care who's back there. It could be freaking Barry Sanders. could be anybody. It doesn't matter if there's nowhere to run. So that offensive line has really been bad. And San Francisco's strength, if there is a strength on that team, is uh, on the defensive side. So I have to thank San Francisco with the points here, but Seattle is the better team, so I think they will come up, come away with a win this week. Getting down to the nitty-gritty of the week, Green Bay at Atlanta, a rematch of the NFC Championship game from last season in the uh, in Atlanta. Uh, we have Atlanta, a three-point favorite at home. Who do you have winning this game, and do you have Atlanta covering? I have Green Bay winning it uh, outright. I just I have an intuition that this Green Bay Packers team is probably the, the Super Bowl contender this year. I think because the NFC, I feel like, is a throw-up every year. You never know. Well, in the NFC, it's usually like who's going to lose to the Patriots in the in the NFC Championship. I feel like Green Bay is a really good team this year. Uh, it's while Atlanta is pretty decent as well, uh, that whole division, uh, a weird stat. I, I feel like we talked about this on another not another podcast, but I, I can't remember. Since 2002, that whole division has had a different uh, winner, the, uh, the, the top of the division, every year since 2002. It's always been different. It's never been the same t- uh, team consecutively two years in a row. So... Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the Buccaneers win the division this year or somehow the Panthers come back. And Atlanta is just kind of worse than they are. I don't know. It's just weird about that division specifically because it never happened in any other division where a different team won every single year since 2002. So uh, Green Bay wins outright. Who do you have? I have the same thing. Green Bay winning outright. I think they're pissed off and they want some revenge for last year's loss in the NFC Championship game. They got embarrassed in that game too. Let's be honest. And, uh, you know, I also just, I feel like Atlanta was just never that good. I always felt like when, I don't know, when they made the Super Bowl, I kind of thought it was like a surprise. Like, I just, I never thought, you know, this is a team that can make the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, they really should have won it. But I just, I don't know, I don't feel like they're a team that's, you know, just because they went to the Super Bowl doesn't mean they're going to be, they're going to be back there for the next five years. Maybe they will, but. I just don't see it. So I have Green Bay winning outright in this game. Sunday night football. Detroit Lions at the New York Giants. The Giants are three-point favorites. Who do you got? I got Giants winning, covering the spread uh, quite easily for me. Uh, It actually, I'll change it to uh, Detroit winning outright if Odell Beckham doesn't play. I think Odell Beckham is going to force himself to play this week. Even he, He's been saying like he's trying his best, and it's looking like he's not, but I think Odell Beckham is going to force himself to play. So I'm going to have Giants winning and covering the spread. Uh, spread. But if he doesn't Ooh. play, I take it back. So uh, who do you got? I have Detroit winning outright regardless. I saw a troubling stat on Sunday Night Football last last week with the Cowboys' 19-3 to victory over the Giants. The Giants' offensive output, going back to, I think, a few weeks before the Steelers played the Giants, back in week, I think it was 13-14, the Giants have scored, I think, more than 20 points just once. And uh, that reflects directly on the offense and Eli Manning. Uh, Whether or not it's completely fair to blame it on Manning, mostly, is a discussion for another time. But, uh, I don't know. Uh... I just, I really, I'm not sold on the Giants right now. So I got, uh, I got Detroit winning uh, out right here. Or sorry, that's Monday Night Football. I should, I have to rephrase. That's actually the Monday Night Football game. Green Bay and Atlanta is the Sunday Night game, I believe. And then now the final game of the week, uh, the game we just looked at, the Vikings and Steelers. The Steelers are six point favorites at home. Austin, we already went over our. Final score predictions, so uh, you got Pittsburgh covering the spread, don't you? Yep, I have Pittsburgh covering the spread. 17-10 victory means they beat the spread. So, yep, and you have the Vikings plus six because of the closeness. Yep, 24-20. So that'll conclude our first look at the uh, Vegas odds for each game this week. But 
Uh, last concluding concluding thoughts here, just a quick note. Seven former Steelers are among the Pro Football Hall of Fame's first nominees list, including uh, former finalist Alan Fanica, uh, Heinz Ward, Joey Porter, Bill Cower, Greg Lloyd, Gary Anderson, and Buddy Parker. Uh, your, do you have any thoughts on these guys and how likely it is, is it for each one of these guys to make it, respectively? Um, my guess is that uh, probably F- uh, Fineca has the best chance, followed by uh, ooh, that's a hard one. But it's it's. I think Fineca's the number one. I think Fineca's probably Fan- making it's, it. It's Fanica. Fanica. I always say Fineca. It, it, it's my bad. Uh, and then uh, it's really hard because I want to say uh, Bill Coer is next. At, oh my God, I can't speak today. Cower, Bill Cower. And then, and then Heinz Ward is third. After that, it kind of gets uh, thrown up because I feel like Joey Porter and Greg Lloyd are are, are, sim- are similar on their ballots. And then Gary Anderson and Buddy Parker, I, I'm not I – can't, I can't really say. I, I know much about them. I'm pr- pretty bad with history. So uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very good. But uh, like I said, I think, I think uh, Fanica is number one to make it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm in agreement with you. Fanica seems more like it's only a matter of time before he makes it in. I think Heinz Ward is – I actually like put these guys in order of how likely I think they're going to make it personally. Um, well, I guess maybe that's not necessarily true. But in any case, Heinz Ward is going to have an uphill battle because of the fact that most of the receivers in his – upcoming generation now have better numbers than him but i think the big thing he's going to have going for him is that super bowl mvp so i don't think he's going to be getting in for the next few years but i think he might have a chance in a few uh joey porter he might but i think he's just more of a you know a great pro bowl type of player i don't see him as a hall of famer uh bill cower i don't think he won enough championships as sad as it is uh to be in the hall of fame i think he's a fantastic coach but i think uh I think the voters are going to look at his uh, his playoff failures prior to his uh, final appearance in the Super Bowl in 2006, and they're going to say, you know, he just wasn't good enough for the most part, minus that Super Bowl, obviously. Uh, Greg Lloyd, I never saw him play. He was a big-time player in the 90s, kind of like a Joey Porter, James Harrison, uh, pass rusher from the early 90s. He was a dynamic player for sure, but uh, I don't – he, he's been up for the Hall of Fame for years now, and he hasn't made it, so I don't think he's going to. Uh, Gary Anderson was, at one point, the all-time leading scorer in NFL history. Uh, no relation here, but Morton Anderson eventually overtook him. They both played around the same time. They both played for something like 24 years, too, so that's interesting to note. Anderson played 10 years for the Steelers to start his career, but he also was well-known for playing for the Vikings as well, but... I just don't see him making it because he's a kicker. Nothing against him. But then Buddy Parker was a coach in the 60s. I don't remember. I got to look him up because uh, Buddy Parker. What? I know he was a coach. Yeah, he was a coach for the Chicago Cardinals, the Detroit Lions, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Hmm. He was a coach for the Steelers from 57 to 64. Interesting. Oh, well, well, in any case, uh, I think he was, yeah, he was the guy that was, okay, I remember now. He was the guy that was around when the Steelers traded for quarterback Bobby Lane from the Lions in the late 50s, early 60s. And Parker was, uh, Parker was he, he led the Steelers to some success, and basically the most success at the time than they ever had beforehand. The Steelers were not a good franchise before then. But the point is that, Parker hasn't made it yet, so he's not going to. That's just the way I see it. So that's our long extended look at the Hall of Fame list. So uh, to wrap things up for tonight, do you have anything else you wanted to say before I get to our announcement? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Well, uh, Austin and I <clears throat> made the decision. Well, uh, <laughs> it, it was kind of a it was kind of a whirlwind kind of thing because. I made the decision a few days ago that I wanted to go to a Steelers game with my girlfriend and my mother, and Austin has never been to Heinz Field before. Kind of strange how it worked out. I had originally been looking for three tickets at Heinz Field for the Steelers-Ravens game on December 10th, and it was, you know, a certain price. And then I was like, what what about four tickets? And for whatever reason, four tickets is cheaper than three tickets from the 300 level. So... Whatever, Austin, Austin, I called him up and uh, 
he said, yeah, you know, I have to check my final schedule because that's when it is. But we decided that uh, we, we had our clear schedule. We we're going to go for it. So we will be attending the Steelers and Ravens week 14 matchup at Heinz Field. So we're very excited to announce that. And I don't know how we're going to handle the whole Twitter stuff, but I don't, I don't think we did that last year on Christmas when they played the Ravens either. But we'll figure something out, and uh, we got time to figure it out. But we were very excited to announce that, and it's going to be Austin's first time at Heinz Field, correct? Uh, it will be. I've only been to uh, MetLife, and I can do it New Era now, what is formerly yeah. Ralph Wilson. Mm -hmm. I, I, the new name screws me up. I knew Ralph Wilson. But I confuse New Era and Hard Rock because they both changed their names at the same time. Two totally different places. One's in Miami, one's in Buffalo, but New Era. Yep. Yep. So Austin has uh, <clears throat> he he's never seen the Steelers in Pittsburgh before, so this is going to be his first chance. So we're really looking forward to that. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you to our fans for supporting us, obviously. And we uh, we hope we can bring you some Steelers news and live tweeting from the game as well. But we're very excited for that. And uh, we're, we are definitely looking forward to that. So uh, we'll have more information on that game as we get closer, obviously. That's still some time away as we're still in the middle of September. Uh, wrapping things up for today, though, if you have any questions about the show, any questions you want us to answer for you, feel free to feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, check out our social media pages. We're on three separate social media sites. We're on Facebook at Stronger Than Steel Podcast, Instagram at Stronger underscore Steel underscore NFL, Twitter at Stronger underscore Steel, and we post our episodes on SoundCloud and YouTube under the same name, Stronger Than Steel Podcast. And we also post all of our content on our website, which is Stronger Than Steel NFL.blogspot.com. We hope you get a chance to check that out. And uh, also, uh, Austin and I have been wanting to finish up uh, our video content from 2016. By last Sunday, we both failed. We each had one last video we wanted to get done. Austin, where are you as far as that goes? Because I'm not done with mine. Oh, I, I, I honestly, I'm at like 60% maybe. That's probably giving myself a lot of credit. I, was, I, still, I still have a while to go, probably more like 50 I'm halfway. A lot of work to do, and uh, when we get it done, we, we will be done with the 2016 season. We'll be moving on to uh, 2017. I was thinking about posting uh, just highlights, Steelers highlights, like positive highlights from uh, each week's game maybe, just some more videos to maybe get more people coming into our site and seeing like what we have to offer. So I think I'm going to start doing that. I'll, I'll actually work on it. If not tonight, then sometime this weekend we'll get some more 2017 videos started because uh, oh, it's it's all about 2017 now. I'm still I I still get sick thinking about that AFC Championship game. It's on to Week Two against the Minnesota Vikings, the Steelers playing at one o'clock on Fox. We hope you all are excited for the game and we're looking forward to it. So, from uh, us here in uh, Rochester, New York, and Long Island. I wanted to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. And, Austin, you take care and have a good night. And uh, we'll be back next week recapping what we hope will be a Steelers 2-0 start to the season.